Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Open Infra Live, the Open Infra Foundation's hour long interactive show sharing production use cases, open source demos, industry conversations, and the latest updates from the global open source, open infrastructure community. We're live here most Thursdays at 1500 UTC, streaming on YouTube and LinkedIn. My name is Jimmy MacArthur from the Open Infra Foundation, and I'll be your host for the day. As mentioned, we're streaming live and we'll be saving some time at the end of the episode for Q&A. So please drop your questions in the comments section throughout the show and we'll answer as many as we can. Our topic today is private clouds versus hyperscalers, a cost savings analysis. And I'd like to welcome our, our guest, Todd Robinson, president of Open Metal. Together, we'll examine the impact that cost has on your cloud infrastructure choices. What are the advantages of going with private versus hyperscalers? And how does open source play a role in that choice? Todd, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'd like to start by noting this is great timing. We just met last week with Timothy Prickett Morgan to discuss his article, The On-Premises Empire Strikes Back at AWS from an open source perspective. And it seems like the whole industry is buzzing about cost and repatriation. But before we get into that, I'm hoping you can give us a quick introduction into Open Metal and the services that you provide. Yeah. Hi, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for having uh, us today. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm with uh, Open Metal and um, I've got a long history in the open source world. And so I always like to share first that uh, I'm uh, open source first and I am uh, a profit second. And, uh, and that to me is always an important thing, I think, being in this particular industry. And so yeah, I come from the era of uh, my, uh, MSQL. I always sometimes I mistake it in the, and, and get to the MySQL, but this is MSQL. This is a uh, Perl CGI days uh, prior to you know many of the wonderful things that we have today. And so yeah, I'm with uh, Open Metal, and Open Metal is a passion project. First, uh, originally spun out of uh, our mother organization in motion hosting, uh, and it is. Uh, based upon our history and knowledge in uh, in uh, open open source uh, technologies, particularly OpenStack and Ceph, um, and it's been something that we've used for automation of our data centers, for providing services uh, within the back end of, of InMotion and many of our other brands. Uh, also, RamNode is one of our other brands where we use uh, OpenStack and Ceph. So we have all this history uh, and institutional knowledge of how to use it for ourselves. And we said, you know, um, one of the things that when we think of open source um, and a concern that I've always had is these systems get more and more complicated. Uh, OpenStack is one of them. We love it, but it is complicated. Um, and things like a, you know, a cloud stack or Kafka or many of the Apache projects that are out there, they become so, um, they, they become so complicated that often it becomes very difficult for people who want to contribute but they, maybe they're an individual to get access and to be able to meaningfully contribute to these complex projects. And so we said, hey, you know what, with OpenStack and Ceph, we can actually, uh, we're already doing this for our, our companies internally. We can hyperconverge this, turn it into a production ready cloud on top of three servers and allow people access to a running uh, ref stack validated uh, OpenStack. And so that they can experience it and use it um, in, in a production environment with production ready day two uh, uh, functionality uh, included with it to be able to let people run an open stack before having to architect an open stack. Yep. And so, yeah, that was always, that's, that's where we said, you know what? And after we did that, we said, wow, you know what? This would be something that um, might, might really resonate with the, uh, with the industry and with the community. So yeah, that's, our, that's our history. And uh, you know, it's again, yeah, I, I love talking about uh, open source and open stack. Um, so I'm just happy to be here to cover those things with you. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So you're you're providing a way for you don't have to be enterprise to to enjoy OpenStack, and that's that's fantastic. Um, I I, I want to go to uh, a blog post that you wrote recently talking about public versus private cloud, and you kind of outlined your thoughts on it. In general, as I mentioned earlier, costs are, are top of mind for anybody that's running their workloads in the cloud. Um, and hyperscalers can offer a cost advantage at the onset because of free credits and incentives. But 
I'd like you to take us through the advantages of moving to private cloud. How can you offset those uh, those advantages that the, the hyperscalers offer? Yeah, so I think um, I always like to talk about uh, tipping points. I think we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, and, and that is that is a fundamental. And so there clearly are. And so uh, open metal, we're a combination really of, of bare metal. We, we, we do that. We're a com we absolutely do uh, public cloud. We absolutely uh, do private cloud and we deliver private cloud on demand, which makes us kind of something uh, in between that. Um, and so our perspective always is, is that there are advantages to, to all the systems. And so you do want to take into account as you're working with this stuff that there are times when those advantages are more important to you uh, based upon your scale, uh, based upon the type of work that you do, maybe based on your philosophy, maybe based on your region. There are certainly regions that are much more um, uh, friendly to the private cloud. And uh, yeah, and so the, the thing that we've got actually up in front of you is um, why Open Metal, here at Open Metal for our large customers, we selected a private first resource management. And uh, actually, if you, get, if you don't mind, flip to the next uh, one. It's I think it'll be easier for people to see. Uh, this, this is a graphic that we had. We're often talking about, okay, why did we make this choice? Why did we say, hey, for um, that we're going to take a, a private first versus a, a, the same approach that most of the public uh, companies do? And it really comes down to a fundamental about the tenant. The tenant is our customer and the tenant that is working inside of the VM. When you're on a public cloud, what's happening is what's up on the board. And so you can see the blue there is your average used resources. And this is something like if you were to look at your graph um, of your utilization, let's say CPU utilization over a day, um, that's going to be like a baseline. And then constantly, obviously, your workload is spiking. The CPU and the RAM and the I.O. is all being used up, but typically in a very um, spiky pattern above that. And so the hash mark blue is takes into account that that activity. Now, in so some cases, it spikes all the way up to the top. And in the red area, this is when you have to have inside of your virtual machine, you've got to have these resources available to accommodate for the spikes needing to go all the way up and max out whatever the uh, resource might be, CPU, IO, et cetera. But in what actually happens in the public cloud, is your your blue and your blue hash marks there those are combined over time and those essentially are your total average uh, utilization the red is what's wasted and the point that we always try to make and why we ended up choosing a private first for our customers is because in this in this scenario the red use resources they go back to the public cloud if you're running on a public cloud and those pub and the public clouds for various uh, various approaches that they use, typically they're going to resell that. That goes back to another customer. They're going to sell that again. Um, and so in our case, when we said, hey, look, that doesn't philosophically doesn't really match up with how we view our, our customer. Like our customer should have access to that resources. They shouldn't have to like be trying to plan their VMs really, really carefully in order to maximize the use of them. Because it, uh, most system administrators, dev, dev, you know, dev, um, dev leaders will tell you, you know, hey, don't try to put all your, um, don't, don't try to put mixed workloads inside of servers or VMs in this case. Instead, you want to use VMs for what they are. Keep them logically separated. In, inside of this, that's what the one of the powers of, of private cloud is, is those unused resources, your private cloud will simply return them to your other VMs. They will return them to the cloud for the cloud to distribute out, OpenStack to distribute out to your other VMs. And that to me then is it gives, it lets uh, companies, it empowers companies to make the choice to say, I'm going to keep my workloads separate. I'm going to give them plenty of resources because I'm not paying on an individual resource basis. I'm paying for the aggregate. And so that, that allows companies to delegate down to their team to spin up new virtual private clouds projects in the OpenStack vernacular, to spin up these projects and use them um, without having to like, oh, is that nickel or dime going to get us? Do I have to go to my manager to figure out if I can afford that or if I can do that? And so, yeah, with this, the point that we were always trying to make is, is that you can leverage the private cloud in a way that lets your team move faster 
uh, because they are not concerned about like, I've got to get everything that I possibly can get out of this VM. You don't have to. The OpenStack will handle that for you and will allow you to over provision if you need to, um, because that uh, is now a shared resource. And the, and the cloud is wonderful, of course, at being able to distribute that uh, resources back and forth. So yeah, sorry, I ran on there a little bit long. What do you, uh, do you oh, have no. any uh, question on there? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it, I, I love it as a differentiator, you know, it's obviously, uh, having a little bit more control over, over your VMs and, and exactly, I think where your, your dollar is going is, is important for, for all these companies. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, this one for sure is it always just takes a bit. Our intention always with these is again, we, we, we provide all these different services. So we're fans of public cloud. We're fans of bare metal use cases. You know, we're fans of private cloud. Um, but it, it is always good to help educate people to know like, look, this is what's really going on behind the scenes. And there are times when you're like, yeah, that's great. I don't care about that. I, you know, I want to be spinning up my VMs uh, on my public cloud, or maybe I'm distributed. Um, so I need to have resources in, you know, hundreds of locations, which uh, some some use cases have that, uh, but uh, but I always like uh, explaining to people the fundamentals that are underneath it. So as they learn, they're able to say, oh, okay, I understand how that's playing in. So I get to make a decision about my cloud about how I want my resources to be distributed. Yeah. So th yeah, this I, uh, yeah this sorry go ahead. No, I was going to say I I love your philosophy. I mean you know, you mentioned earlier open source first, profit second, which is you know but not not the norm I think in the business, but. I also love the philosophy of, of keeping the customer first and, you know, selling the customer's own paid resources back to other people in the public cloud is, is obviously not ideal. Right. And, and what you're giving here is, is sort of a level playing field. Um, and I, I think that's I think that's smart. I like it. Yeah. And, and I'll also say so some sometimes when you're buying from the public cloud, you are buying uh, more fixed resources. And so they may not be doing this. Definitely. There's many cases where this is happening, but you also may be buying like kind of almost like a bare metal like uh, and that you're assuredly getting those resources. The issue with it is, is you, you still you still are not going to want to cram absolutely everything you can into that VM to actually get your your full value out of it, to actually use the resource. You're not going to want to do that. Because yeah, then you're going to end up you know mixing things that shouldn't be mixed, or you're maxing out things at inopportune times. And so I always say, yeah, one of the powers of public cloud or private cloud is that you have this level of control. You decide where those extra resources go and when they go there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I, I wanted to to touch on one other thing on, on the uh, on, on your blog post. You you mentioned uh, David Hansen, the the Ruby on Rails creator. <laughs> Um, who had a, a very public breakup with with uh, hyperscaler public cloud? Um, any similar stories from your perspective, from Open Metal's pers perspective of uh, of customers that have been sort of fed up with the hyperscalers and 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 moved on to to your services? Yeah, and uh, I've got a little uh, just because I followed the, uh, the the provider there, uh, Thirty Seven Signals, right? They do Basecamp and Hey. And so they had the advantage of running actually hybrid, I guess could be the term is. So they had always run Basecamp inside of a data center and they were running Hay out on the public cloud. And so they had a lot of the skill sets that are necessary um, and the institutional knowledge themselves to help them go like, well, wait a second, like, why is this public cloud so expensive? Because they have a direct comparison. Um, and so they were able to make choices pretty easily to say like, wait a second, this just doesn't make sense. Plus I already have these uh, skill sets. And uh, yeah, so yeah, we've, uh, I've, I've followed them many times over the years as a Basecamp user early on in, in my career. And so um, we find that that, unless you have that perspective where you actually are seeing both of them literally at the same time, um, and so that you can very clearly make that uh, choice. You have to get out there and explore um, what might be your other options. Now, typically you're going to do this when the numbers get pretty significant. Um, and so they were in numbers that were very significant, like uh, they, they, they were very public about posting all these things. And so, you know, at, you know, at $10,000 a month to a public cloud, does that make sense for you to start looking? Maybe at 20 or at 30 or at 40 and they were starting to get into some of these numbers that were very large and they were easily able to compare it yeah and so our case um uh one one of the uh, public company uh, companies that has been public about their 
um, usage of us is a company called Convezio. It's a really cool WordPress uh, hosting, so like software as a service uh, uh, approach. Uh, and, and they themselves were facing that same thing is very large expenses associated with things that they would think of as fundamental to the performance of their product for their customer and and having to pay like a really large um expense for those things and and then having to like end up with a, a question of like you know do i choose the most powerful best thing for my customer um where where it's an expense that's uh that's exaggerated against what their business model could support right but the, their side they were uh, they their philosophy was customer first, which uh, you know of course we love is customer first. So they were really driven to the decision to say like no, I have to go out and find out what are the other options that are out there because I have to have that performance. Boy, I can't do it at that cost. And, and some of my competitors are out there doing it, uh, but they're you know skimping a little bit on the performance. And so they were driven to to start shopping around uh, for performance first and then and then costs second. Which we, which we love because if you tune your private cloud properly, you're going to get that performance and you're going to get the cost savings. Yeah, so uh, Convezio is a great example. Check them out. Uh, they're a customer of ours. We love that. Uh, Pipestream is another uh, company that um, was they use this for their development pipelines. And they had found, um, you know, development pipelines are kind of an interesting workload because when the when the when the team is working and they're pushing, um, and there's lots of activity and they need a lot of resources. But typically, you also don't want to tear it down when they're not working. Um, and tearing it down is you know requires its own um, set of work in order to create pipelines like that. And so they ended up moving over to us because they were looking at the expense that they had in their pipeline and saying like this is just for the amount that we actually use. Why why is this thing so expensive? And us being, you know, again, OpenStack, you know, is cloud native. Call the API. The API is wonderful. It does what you, exactly what you would expect it to do, just like any other cloud provider. And yeah, so Pipestream is, is another example. So uh, typically for us, uh, you're, we're seeing software as a service companies. We're seeing uh, OpenStack uh, companies, companies that are like, look, I've been running my own OpenStack, but you guys do it faster and easier for us. We're seeing that come over to us. Um, yeah, those are, yeah. Did that uh, give you an idea there, Jimmy? Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic, and I I think you know you bring up a good point, which is it, it, the the scale, right? If I'm if I'm a person that's starting my business, uh, probably you know a hyperscaler is is just fine to get started. Obviously, we prefer OpenStack powered public clouds, of which there are many and and some fine choices out there. Um, but you know it. it brings brings to mind something that that you mentioned in another blog post um which is the the cost tipping point right so like at what point do you scale so much that you know obviously 37 signals and and base camp or, or hey uh, you know those are extreme examples of, of like very very high traffic websites but you know or services and for but but for the regular joe uh who's, who's starting up a business what's what's the point that uh you start to get to to to, to really make the move yeah so we see uh, yeah the tipping point is um really is a um a real thing um, that is wise to be aware of and to also note that tipping point especially in the private area has been increasingly coming down and so as automation has occurred in the private, let, let's call it the private uh, world, it's data center automation, uh, OpenStax, Ironic, or Bifrost, uh, we use it, it's a, it's a wonderful automation system. Uh, those um, improvements that have been going on um, in that world uh, has lowered the tipping point. But tipping points are typically made up of a couple different things. So of course, it's going to be your compute. You know, how much compute are you realistically using? What's your egress? Uh, egress is a pretty expensive item uh, on the public cloud uh, because they have found that as a as a relatively straightforward place to make uh, you know make a pretty pretty big margin um, and so if you're egress um, you're going to be looking at egress and if your egress is very expensive um, in the in the private world let's call it if you're running um if you're either out of your own data center um, which i think is less and less 
uh, common for the mid-sized company. But if you're running out of a, co a co-location facility, or if you could be running out of a co-location facility, certainly you do got to take into account like, hey, look, I might have to have my network uh, devices. I've got to have my connectivity. Um, but in, in, in a lot of cases, you can be buying some of that trivially from your data center provider, your colo provider. Uh, or in our case, it's the same thing. It's like we're that blend of, uh, of uh, between the public and the private. And so, yeah, egress is a common uh, tipping point just because it can really add up. You know, we've seen bills, uh, especially for uh, companies that are moving, you know, hundreds of terabytes, you know, and you start getting up into the petabytes, you can be in thirty, forty, fifty thousand uh, dollars a month on those things. And and uh, I think what you yeah, what you've got up on the uh, board right there is just a quick analysis of what the public cloud can end up running you. And so, yeah, I'll just pick on uh, the third one down there. So we call it the large uh, deployment. It's a thousand VMs, 150 terabytes. Those are relatively small uh, VMs in this comparison. So if you're using very large uh, VMs, like, uh, you know, 64 vCPU type uh, ones, uh, that's a much smaller number that might only be like 100 in this case. But what you can see on the public cloud is, um, and we use the 150 terabytes of egress. And keeping in mind, they're often charging like uh, between four and a half cents, five, five and a half cents uh, per gig uh, for for this. Those numbers really add up significantly. And so egress definitely is one of them where you'll find people go like, "Hey, I've got to figure out a different uh, a different solution for this." The the VMs themselves. Um, depending on what you're choosing from the catalog that might be available uh, there are ways to to be economic more economical on the on the public cloud but typically um, anything that is offered on the public cloud you're going to find uh, on the private cloud either by providers like us or many of the other ones that are offering it out there and so yeah and so what you'll see and i think uh, on the board there is for example that third level one your yearly difference might be coming in at 170 ish to 180 ish thousand dollars and so those are ones where you start to say, hey, and in our case, we're, we, what's on the board there is we're comparing it with a managed uh, private cloud. And so that's oftentimes easier for companies that are coming off of the public cloud to not have to step fully into the complete management of the system. And so we will often do comparisons against the managed private cloud. So that's when you've got a company that you contracted with that helps you run the, the, your private cloud. Um, over time, in our case, we encourage our customers to learn more and more about it. And as they become more comfortable with the automation that we've used for managing the cloud, they they have a choice then. They can make a choice to shift in between um, managing it themselves or having us or, or a third party manage it. Uh, but as you can see, the numbers really can add up there. It, it, isn't, it isn't for public cloud for smaller installations are wonderful. It's exactly what it's for. Um, and you can, and it's a it's easily a more economical thing to do. So definitely, like the, you can see the very first one there, small hundred VMs, uh, ten terabytes of transfer. If you're if you're really looking at saving eighteen thousand or so um, a year, you're probably in the spot where maybe philosophically you don't want to be on the public cloud. And so it's a reasonable thing to make a change over to a private cloud at that stage. But typically, that wouldn't be a cost driven decision. Uh, but yeah, as you create, as you go up in these levels, again, watch out for your egress, watch out for your storage costs. Uh, let's just you know, use the typical S3. Um, certainly you can be um, less expensive. Um, but one of the things we also find is that companies are looking, I'll, I'll proffer this as a category, uh, is speed of completing a job. And this just means like if you're if you're doing a modeling job, for example, and you need your compute to finish up with its model and it needs to push its uh, data off into a, 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 an S3 bucket um, and you need to and then you need and once that's done, you're going to pick up another job. Well, what we found is that by physical location it actually really comes into play in the speed of your job. And so sure. that you can do your compute, get that model done, shove it off into an S3 bucket that's literally like next door, right, uh, uh, network wise, um, and complete your workload in a, in a more timely fashion. So there's also some of these hidden tipping points that have to do with like looking at how long does it actually take me to process this stuff? Um, and it is moving data around is a big part of that. Okay, I'll add on for a bit there too, Jimmy. What other, yeah, what uh, questions are? No, you're on? you're you're great. I mean, I I think, you know, one of the one of the common arguments against private cloud is that like once you factor in all the 
costs of operations and data center costs and procurement, et cetera, that, that in the end, public cloud is less expensive. And I think this is a, this is a good way to look at it, to, to understand that there are, there are costs that are outside or, or sort of separate from what your, your regular bill looks like. Um, so yeah, I, I, this is, this is good stuff. It definitely is. It's um, the, the dipping points often come up and it typically is going to come up for a manager or is a leader in the in the IT side. It may be driven by the CFO, the CFO going like, wow, these numbers are large or I'm getting all this uh, spikiness. And so we're now out of budget um, and what's going on. And, then, and so that's often one of the drivers. Um, and then I would just encourage those leaders that do end up facing this question of like, how do I need to drive this down is there are lots of places to go and you do want to challenge um, this thought that the public cloud is less expensive because in many cases it's not, it is a tipping point um, and there are a lot of options and the private area, um, whether it's that you're going to decide to run your own um, uh, co-location facility, get your own hardware, uh, or you're going to um, use automated um, bare metal uh, from a provider. But I would just encourage you, like, there are a lot of options out there that have had had significant improvements over the last years. You know, so as public cloud was kind of blowing up and everybody's like, oh, everybody's got to get onto the public cloud. Um, there was a lot of things going on uh, for the private area. And so it's a lot more uh, efficient uh, than it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And I would just encourage people to, to um Open, open up again uh, to that to the concept of that you can run a lot of this stuff yourself, or you can run it with partners, um, and it's still cloud native. You're still doing the same work. You're still shoving. You know, you're still using APIs, just like your team has probably become used to. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, it's it's funny because I, I think that you know everybody thinks of uh, of moving to the cloud as this, you know, there's the one approach and you get locked in and uh, we can't run on prem anymore and, and this and that. And I, you're exactly right. There are plenty of options out there. There's plenty of things. And you, you said something uh, when we were talking earlier about it's not a move to the cloud. It's not a physical destination, but it, it's an approach. Um, I'd love to hear sort of a little bit of expounding on that philosophy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I would say uh, I've heard this terminology from a few people. I wish I knew exactly where when when someone had said this to me, like cloud is not a physical destination. It is a philosophy. You don't move like get up and move to the cloud. It's an it's adopting philosophies like API first. It's adopting philosophies of being able to deploy infrastructure in a automated, trivial fashion. Um, infrastructure is code. These are all, these are for, for me, that is the definition of cloud, not a physical location, but the hyperscalers have definitely kind of got that uh, set in people's mind. Like I need to move to the cloud. Well, in fact, it's, it's techniques and approaches versus actually a physical move. So when you go back and forth between providers, that might be a physical move, but that's a provider. That is not a philosophy. And I would definitely encourage people, both our company have has made this transition over the many years, like our uh, mother company started in like 2001. So there wasn't this cloud philosophy, right? There wasn't this API separation, let one service do its thing, let the other service do its thing, and those could be independently developed. Um, instead, we, we had to make that transition. And so we absolutely have some of the old systems as well as the new systems, but we didn't move. We just learned that, hey, that is a more efficient way to do it and let free up the developers to be able to spawn up resources as they see fit. But that's that's OpenStack is, I would say, like a lot of times when I see services out there and I go, oh, like Barbican, and then I see uh, like HashiCorp's vault, and I'm like, wait a minute, boy, that really looks like Barbican. What is that exactly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And then you can say like, there really is a lot of what the cloud is came out of what OpenStack was doing um, and, and the philosophy, it's not necessarily the exact software systems or API, you know, and, and how the APIs work, but the philosophy, and I would say Op uh, OpenStack was a real leader, um, you know, and, and continues to push that. Uh, and, but, but I would still go back to like, I think it's healthy for people to think of like, when you move back and forth between good providers that are modern, they're all going to be API first. This is the, this is the cloud, right? And you can use that uh, to your advantage, knowing that, no, I'm not going to be asking my team to like, 
uh, re-engineer a whole bunch of stuff. You know, instead I'm going to say, uh, does it does the Terraform provider have the functionality that I need? Oh, yes, it does. Look at that. And, and you're going to find, of course, a lot of people are running in Terraform and you can move that back and forth between the cloud providers. But so, yeah, yeah, not cloud. Uh, cloud is not a, a physical destination. It's a it's a philosophical destination of, of making and using uh, resources more easily and trivially. Yeah, I, 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 that's fantastic. I, I think there's been. People talk a lot about hybrid cloud. I, I think it's a term that's confusing to, to folks, um, but kind of the way you're you're laying it out makes a, a lot of sense. It's just it's just a choice of of where best to put your workloads and what makes the most sense from a, an efficiency perspective. And I, I think that's great. Um, speaking of efficiency, uh, so we've talked a lot about cost efficiency, but another thing that's kind of top of mind for consumers for the world, I suppose, uh, is is resource consumption, power consumption, uh, and how that affects, you know, uh, our day-to-day our -day lives. Um, you know, sustainability is is really something that uh, there's, there's repatriation, which seems to be the word of 2023. Uh, and then there's uh, sustainability, which I think is just this ongoing challenge in the industry. Uh, how is open metal tackling that and and how do you see openstack playing a role in that moving forward uh, that, yeah that's an interesting question so definitely on the uh the repatriation um i would say this watch out for the nomenclature um, when you repatriate repatriate uh, if you're going to be moving uh, workloads off of the the mega clouds or the hyperscalers um Hopefully you're, you've already targeted OpenStack um, as the place that you're going to be uh, uh, bringing them into. And so in that case, you're still on the cloud. So you get to still use the API. So repatriation um, is really just moving providers. You know, maybe you're going to be doing it yourself. Maybe you're going to be doing it on uh, bare metal, uh, bare metal provider. Maybe you're going to be doing it on somebody like us. Uh, so yeah, repatriation. Uh, uh, I think it's a great uh, it's a great concept. Uh, it really just is m moving another moving to another provider. You're, st you're still going to be in the cloud. You're still going to be using that uh, for sustainability and looking forward. I think for me is um, I've always this is there's several things that we do, but I'll but I'll focus on 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 this one is that you as we um, as we uh, provision and use these large um, workload systems, these whether they're servers or whether you're on a VM somewhere, is that you do want to be wise about what you're doing. Um, you want to understand uh, what's going on underneath if you really want to have a kind of a whole picture of what your utilization might be. You know, and, and I would definitely encourage people like uh, we run into this um, even with um, there's a there's sometimes a, there's a philosophy of like hold on to every piece of data that you ever had, and I would just say I would encourage people like that doesn't ever end. <laughs> so if you have that <laughs> philosophy, right, it doesn't end. And, it, and there's there's several things. So one, yeah, it's going to cost you it's going to cost you dollars to keep that, but it, but it also is it, it has a broader reach. Is like if you're buying those servers or you're buying that that space, somebody is buying a server. Like people go, hey, serverless. Serverless is not really a thing. There's, of course, a server, and you're and you are utilizing those resources. And those resources mean somebody has built that piece of, of that device. They have, you know, pulled the rare earth or whatever out of the ground. And they have turned that into a server. They've put it on a ship. They've got it into a data center. They're plugging it in. So I just say, that for sure, in our space, that is absolutely. Um, the path that we're going on, right? Like, is people do need these services. But I would just say, be wise about those things. Understand that both your cost um, is dependent on decisions that you're making that might also have impact on uh, on resource usage that has a you know a, a, an impact across the world. So yeah, I'm not sure, Jimmy, if that's uh, I'm going to be able to answer as many of those questions. Um, I love things about like I, uh, our our data center in Amsterdam. I, my understanding does not have this. But like, for example, uh, there are data centers in, in Amsterdam that um, the hot water, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the cooling water is delivered to the city to use as hot water for the city. So those are the kinds of things like that. I, when I hear people come up with these kind of like innovative use cases and I go like, that's pretty clever. Um, I always like to just shine lights on things like that as people start to make 
uh, changes to say, well, wait a second, let's look at this a little bit differently. You know, data centers are here to stay. I mean, yes, they, they absolutely are, but there are ways to have them serve multi-purpose. Uh, so that yeah. was like a great invention. So yeah, I, I, I can't speak enough on it, I think, um, but hopefully that gives you some perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, we've got a, a couple of those folks in our community. Cloud and heat transfers their uh, the heat generated from the data center back into apartment buildings, and Leaf Cloud does something similar. Um, Very cool. But yeah, I actually I, I wanted to ask. I, I know that you have data center in in the Netherlands, and then uh, obviously in, in the U.S. as well. Um, part of I think people moving back to you know, open stack powered public clouds and open stack powered private clouds is because of this kind of push by the European Union for GDPR and, and kind of data sovereignty. Um, at the same time, that doesn't seem to be such a concern for, for folks in the US, but I, I wonder, do you see that trend changing? Do you see uh, US companies and, 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 and US citizens kind of rethinking uh, their own sort of privacy impl implications? I think the US, um, there is pretty definitive differences, I think, between uh, our European um, and our US base. Uh, the Europeans, I think there's many factors actually that have uh, the Europeans um, approaching how they do these things uh, differently. One of them is, is that um, the hyperscalers, these are American companies that, you know, for lack of a better term, are coming in on the European turf um, without necessarily having the same philosophical uh, alignment as many of the Europeans do. So first off is that that's an impact is, is that I think um, here in the U.S., there are American companies. We're proud of those companies in many cases. We've grown up with them a bit. Um, and I think our view of the brands tend to be more positive than the Europeans. So first off, the Europeans uh, tend, I think, are very much looking at those uh, organizations and saying, first off, they don't align philosophically. Um, and then second off, they're not from here. And so it's a little bit, it, it's a lot more difficult uh, to deal with them. Um, now, obviously, they, they have introduced many laws to help um, those company encourage those companies, let's say, to align with their philosophies. So that that we notice first is in some cases uh, we have a, a wonderful company, uh, my mini factory, uh, who, who is with us, and and they just they're like, yeah, we don't want to work with them. Like that's just something that's important to us. We don't want to work with them. Um, versus working with a company that is very they're a very very open source, um, a very grassroots company. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think what you what, what we see the difference between this, I think you're right in that the U.S. some um, companies don't think as much about data sovereignty because they are just kind of used to, hey, this is the, what I work under and I know where my data is. My data is here. Um, so, yeah, I would say that there is quite a bit of a difference. I don't do I see you, you'd ask, like, do I do we see if the U.S. companies are taking it more serious? Uh, you know, are they looking at it more like yeah. the I guess what I'm I think so. I, what I'm seeing is more, you know, for instance, uh, there's a, an organization called OROC that is uh, that is uh, private cloud specifically built for the government um, to government standards, but that's running on OpenStack. I'm seeing more OpenStack powered public clouds pop up, which you know, three four years ago I, we wouldn't have seen that. As we you and I were talking about before the show. You know, open metal might have seemed like a risk three or four years ago to a lot of folks, but you've hit this niche where it's, you know, there is a, a turning point. And I guess in the U.S. it's cost, right? Um, and and in, in Europe, it's it's a combination of cost and, and data sovereignty uh, kind of driving that. But uh, I, I do feel like people are becoming a little bit more cognizant of it here, here in the States. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, though. I think um, first uh, we the first thing that's on people's minds is cost. I think that that's that's the the world that we're in. And uh, yeah, you you had mentioned have did we face an uphill battle when we first said uh, one of my closest friends in the world said to me he's like, what are you doing? Like, why would you try to take on Amazon or or somebody like that? Uh, why would you do that? Now this was a few years back. 
And he says, that's just foolish, you know, like going up against a company, those sets of companies like that. Um, and in some ways, yeah, he was probably right. There's some, <laughs> there's some foolishness inside of there. But also I would say like th there is a place for, for for this type of product for for open stack to be vibrant at the mid-level they were you know, as an enterprise of course it was always a logical choice and for data center managers say companies like us who had to run data centers, it was always a logical choice it's a brilliant piece of software or brilliant set of uh, software um, but to bring it to the mid-level yeah the, i think that that what is driving people though to consider it uh, here in the u.s mostly is cost is they've hit a tipping point and they make decisions like when those numbers get big like that, 20 or 30 or $40,000 a month that you're saving, when they realize that, look, I can take those dollars and I can hire more developers and I can move the product faster. It's not often like, hey, I'm just going to drive that to the bottom line. There's definitely some companies that are obviously going to do that. But some of it is like, no, it helps me move faster because I'm not blowing all that money on this part of my business. Instead, I get to put it towards my product. A lot of the, a lot of the SaaS companies have that. They're going to come to us and that's what they're they're saying first is like i just want to move the dollars out of here over to here because this sure. is valuable to me but do we see them as data sovereignty i would say oroc and and, and uh, we definitely have companies that um do especially when working for government agencies and things like that that very much um do follow that but uh, to be honest it's two, it's really two things it's a control issue with performance so they're like look my i don't my um my ratios, you know, I need lots of RAM or I need a little bit of RAM or I need lots of IO and none of the flavors that I can buy from the public clouds are like that. And so I'm ending up having to like buy something that has tons of NVMEs attached to it just because I need a lot of vCPU or I need a lot of CPU. And so it's just, it's kind of a waste of money. So you, you see that often it's a performance discussion, um, but cost is, is very much top of mind in the U.S., uh, the, the Europeans, I think, are more are very much more aligned with what you're saying. Like, that I want to understand where my data is, where my customers of the visitors or users of my application, where their information is going to be. Um, they want to be more empowered. I think that that's also a piece of that. But I would say, though, the it feels like the U.S. market, like fast forward a couple of years from now. And as people learn that this type of product is available and that OpenStack is now, you know, um, more accessible um, and, and again, OpenStack has become easier. And I would I, for everybody listening, I think you already know this, but OpenStack has become easier and easier to use. There are a lot of these small uh, systems that allow you to fire it up on a single computer um, and follow uh, uh, and follow through on getting familiar and using it. Um, but I think uh, fast forward a few years from now, and because this ease of use has um, become more uh, prevalent or, or the market has become more aware, I think the empowerment part will become more clear as people will come in and yeah. say, I want that because I want access to it. I want to be able to modify my flavors so that it's fast, as fast as it can possibly be because I need my workflow to get done or my customers are doing something and I want it to be fast for them. Yeah, no, I, I, that makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, so sometimes it can be hard for folks to go all in on private cloud. So we see a lot of users turning to hybrid. When doing this, uh, what types of workloads are best for private cloud over public cloud? <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely would say going going all in on on private cloud, uh, you would do that over time. So I think that's what you're getting at is, is that it has to do first with understanding uh, what its capabilities are. And then so, yeah, specifically, if I was looking at workloads, so some of them uh, that we see are uh, big math models might be someplace where you're like, uh, because I need I need a ton of access to CPU but I'm gonna be shipping the data out. But you go out to the public cloud, you can't buy a flavor that's just all CPU and RAM and no, and basically no disk. You're gonna buy something that's gonna come with a bunch of, you know, probably a third of your cost is gonna be something that you don't need. So that that could be an area where, where you're coming in. This flavor, the what I was talking about about flavors is when you have workloads that don't fit um, those common um, ratioed, uh, 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 you know, VM, VM types flavors that you can buy out there. Uh, your tip, look at your tipping points. And so the private cloud, I think when people say that, um, sometimes egress is like an easy one, is if you've got really large egress bills, you you are, you are should go start shopping. <laughs> you should start looking around to figure out 
what are some of the alternatives that are out there? And, and that's a funny one because that's not really private cloud. That doesn't have to do with private cloud. That has to do with how you purchase your bandwidth from your from a provider. Uh, but but because you need to stay cloud native, or, or I would advise that you stay cloud native, what you are going to find is that you may end up on a private cloud because you do need to make the transition to essentially buy, either buying your own bandwidth from a provider or going with a provider that's going to give you a price that's logical for you. So definitely it's going to be, um, you're looking for the, your tipping points. You're going to look at your workloads, find, find the most expensive ones, start with that. So you can always say like, all right, let me open up this big bill of mine at which it can be a bit tricky, but you open up the bill and you got to start looking for commonalities. And so, yeah, if you've got, let's say 50 big VMs, the, the, the really large ones, and you're paying $3,000 a month or something for these really large VMs, but you've got commonality there you can spot that. You'll be able to see those in your bills and you say, okay, that's an area where I should focus. So yeah, start with that. Start with the bill, take a look through to find commonalities and workloads. And those would be ones that I would often target. And I would definitely encourage now, this is open, me as open metal talking, of course, I would encourage you to, when before you go all in in, in um, private cloud is um, spend some time with some of the organizations that um, will help you through that. There's, there's great contractors out there that can say, look, I can help you build that cloud and, and I can do it in a way that's not oversized. Remember like uh, OpenStack and Ceph, they're designed around uh, adding and removing um, resources within there. So don't, don't go into this like thinking like I need to build this huge cloud. You don't need to do that. These systems are fantastic at being able to add and remove resources to expand and contract your cloud. So you, I would say try, to, try not to go um, with a, I need to spec this for a really large, start with a small one and understand how those things work but they are scalable those systems are very scalable that's one of the improvements over these many uh, previous years that you can rely on they're very good at adding and removing uh, resources yeah and, and an advantage you know that's the cloud advantage right it's uh and you don't have to go on-prem you don't have to plan out a whole data center you've already got that available and and you can pick and choose and see what see what fits right yep you got it Love it. Well, um, I think I don't know if there's anything you want to you, you want to close with, Todd. Yeah, I think um, I would. I always like to kind of go back uh, to this um, concept of um, stepping into uh, the the cloud world, uh, stepping into the private world, or where infrastructure you're going to be a little bit closer to infrastructure, and um, and recommend to people whenever you're looking through um choices that you have that um people are often fearful and they say hey well i'm gonna have to run the hardware again or i'm gonna have to do procurement again but look around there's there's areas that you can allow uh your other providers to do those things for you um, but that you can also look within your team to recognize that many times running servers didn't change when you moved into VMs. So th this is actually one of the points that the, the, the 37 signals was making, um, that David was making, is that um, when you run VMs, you're, you have system administration skills. Your, your DevOps team has skills that are, they know how to run their stacks. They know how to run operating systems. They know these things. And if they um, have, stepped away from a little bit and companies over the years by moving to the private cl uh, public cloud sometimes the message was hey you know you're not going to have to have system administrators anymore um and, and reality is, is no you're still running servers and and in some cases you're running hundreds or thousands of servers still you have to have a lot of, of, of really good skills now what i so what i can say is and, and 37 signals experienced this is they didn't have additive staff when they when they brought hay in house or as they're bringing hay in, in house today, because they already had a skilled set of, of system administrators that were running inside of VMs. And so those skill sets still exist and you still need to have them. And in fact, for a lot of software as a service companies, 
that's going to be one of your advantages is how effective is your stack inside of a VM or on bare metal or wherever it happens uh, to be in a container or something like that. And so I would say is like that there is a lot, typically there is quite a bit of skill set still inside of a company that that is going to be running servers. And so you don't have to be so afraid of some of these um, the running running the bare metal itself. Um, because in this case, a lot of your team has that. And you can also look at it as an opportunity for the team to get even better, the team that's managing your VM, to even get even better at the stack that they're running, right? And it gives them advantage when they get a little more fundamental to say, wow, actually, I know how to carry this back up to the customer like that. And, and I can make my whole system faster because now I have a better fundamental understanding. So, yeah, so I would just end with that is like, I know sometimes it can be a little bit uh, nerve wracking to say, well, we don't have those skill sets. And so how are we going to take on this extra work? But um, in many cases, you have staff that are skilled at your at your servers. Anyways, they just happen to be inside of VMs. They can run <laughs> they can run bare metal just as well. Love it. Um, well, listen, uh, we are about out of time here. And I want to thank you very much uh, for for taking some time out of your day and, and talking with our audience today. I really appreciated the conversation. Yeah, Jimmy. No, thank you for having me. And again, I, I, I'm just excited that the, the industry is now talking so much about this um, and that, uh, you know, more and more options are now becoming our, our light is being shined on more and more options and that uh, OpenStack is front and center. I know OpenStack has been growing uh, dramatically in these last couple of years, uh, rightfully so. Uh, because it has this capability and it stayed true to its API first nature. Um, and so like, to me, I, I'm just excited for OpenStack. I'll give a shout out to Seth as well. Seth is a, is a fan, is a, I'm a fan, fa it's a fan favorite for me. Um, and I was around uh, the time when Seth uh, had, sp had spun out a dream host. Um, and so I, I'm also excited to see it taking such a, a major role uh, in, in here alongside of uh, OpenStack. So, but yeah, yeah, just very excited. And I know, I think we've got an upcoming uh, um, meet and greet, um, but yeah, I don't know if you wanted to shift over to that and talk a little bit about um, the upcoming uh, conference here, Jimmy, before we cut. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, first, let me say uh, for those of you that, that have DevOps folks that are considering moving to private cloud, Open Metal has some fantastic uh, tutorials on how to jump into OpenStack. Uh, check out their LinkedIn page. I don't think I have a link ready, but um, but I wanted to, to plug that and say thanks to Open Metal for for really supporting the OpenStack project. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and yes, uh, as Todd said, join us in Vancouver, uh, June thirteenth to fifteenth. Open Metal will be there. They are a sponsor of the event, and uh, so will many of our other organizations. Uh, and we'd like to thank uh, the sponsors of the event. Our headline sponsor, of course, Wind River, and our premier sponsor, Orchestro, and all of our exhibitor sponsors, including Open Metal. Uh, thanks so much for supporting the event. And if you have any interest in, uh, in joining the event or sponsoring it, hit me up at jimmy at openinfra.dev, and I'm happy to provide some more information on that. Uh, and uh, remember, if you have an idea for a future episode, submit your ideas at ideas.openinfra.live, and perhaps we'll see you on a future show. And finally, I'd like to thank all of our Open Infra Foundation members to make all of this possible. If your organization would like to join the Open Infra Foundation, take a look at openinfra.dev slash join. Thanks much, and have a wonderful day. <laughs>